Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. As divided as we are today about the state of our current politics, the debate about facts, it seems that at least we can agree about our shared history. And yet even that is sometimes debated today. When did America begin? Who gets credit? How did it shape us? My guest, Patrick O'Donnell, is one of our most distinguished military historians. He's the author of 12 books, including The Unknowns and Washington's Immortals. He served as a combat historian in a Marine rifle platoon during the Battle of Fallujah. And he has dedicated himself to understanding the truth about our history, particularly our military history, and its importance in helping us better understand who we really are and where we came from. It is my pleasure to welcome Patrick O'Donnell back to this program to talk about his newest work, The Indispensables. Patrick, it's good to talk to you again. It's great to be back, Jeff. I, I, I relish this. Uh, you know, this is something we've been doing for, I think, well over 15 years. Uh, captured many of the books that I've written, and I, I always enjoy coming on your show. Well, it's great to talk to you and, and, and talk a little bit about how you find these stories that have been, A, neglected over the years in many cases, but yet are so essential to understanding our history. Jeff, all the stories and books that I've written have found me, and they found me in one way or another. Uh, with Washington's Immortals, it was a, a roadside sign that said, you know, here lie 256 Continental soldiers, Maryland heroes. And that sign is called out to me to write Washington's Immortals. Uh, this book found me through Washington's Immortals because they transported the Marylanders at the Battle of Brooklyn. This is the, the men that, that rode Washington's army across the Delaware, but also the East River, saving it from annihilation. And and then I had some sort of coincidental things that happened. I had I mentioned to people, hey, I'm writing a book about a, a regiment that changed the course of the war. And they're like, oh, you wrote, you're writing about the, Mar the Marbleheaders. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I'm writing about the Marylanders, but that's a really good idea. And, you know, after about nine or ten of those, um, it became really clear that I needed to tell the story of the Marbleheaders, who really, it's an obscure story. It's an untold story uh, until the Indispensables. And it's really been uh, really an amazing journey of five years of hardcore research. All of it, almost all of it, primary sources uh, to tell the story of the people, the main drivers of the revolution who were in Marblehead, which is about 16 miles north of Boston. But in 1774, it was a bustling city and it was the second largest city in Massachusetts and one of the wealthiest ports and cities in the, the colonies at the time. Um, and it was, uh, you know, here that these men, and I also cover some of the women who were really quite extraordinary in this book, uh, their stories kind of emerge and they are a mainspring of the revolutionary movement in beginning in seven, 1765 and moving all the way through 1775, the, you know, kinetic beginning of the revolutionary war. And tell us about the Marblehead Regiment. How did, how did the regiment originally come together? The, the regiment is, uh, was initially a militia unit that was, was formed to protect the town. Uh, and it has its origins prior to the French and Indian War. And uh, it, it, it was a situation where you have the uh, sort of the town's elite, in many cases, are commanding officers of the, of the unit, as well as the company commanders and but it's, it's, it's really an extraordinarily diverse collection of individuals. It's the wealthy, it's the, it's the super poor, but it's also diverse racially. And you have free African-Americans in this unit. You have Native Americans, uh, people of Native American ancestry. You have Hispanics. The, you know, people that had sort of come, come a, along with the Marbleheaders because it's an exceptionally cosmopolitan city for the time. It was a trading hub, and they traded all around the world for goods. But the primary thing that these individuals were involved in was cod fishing, and cod fortunes were made on fish. And, it, you know, cod can be like a 100-pound fish or a three or 300-pound fish. They're massive, and these guys would, would go to the Grand Banks which, you know, is the, the most treacherous waters of the world. It was a, um, 
you know, extremely hazardous situation where many, many men would lose their lives every year just to the sea. So it was, these are hardened men, hardened individuals that interestingly worked side by side together on fishing boats. So they form an amazing like sense of teamwork and life and death decisions are made uh, in a split second. So race doesn't really matter. It's all about you know, getting the job done in most cases. And this later translates into arguably one of the, the greatest fighting units in American history uh, that's never really ever been um, covered until the Indispensables. And the diversity of the unit that you talk about, how unique was that compared to other units at the time? It's, it was exceptionally unique. Um, and it was, it, it, they had a larger number than, than just about any other regiment. Um, but the American Revolution does have a, a diversity of uh, – it, it, the, the racially – the, the, the units are in many cases racially diverse. And then tragically, this, this doesn't – this changes um, after the war, um, and it, it, they, we don't see it again uh, very tragically until 1948. But – these men were on the very forefront of the civil rights movement because of what they were doing, and the, the leaders of this unit were ardent abolitionists. They hated slavery, and they were at the forefront of getting rid of slavery in Massachusetts, which happens in 1783, but they were also trying to get it out of the Constitution. For instance, one of the main characters in this book is Elbridge Arian, a forgotten father uh, in many founding father in many ways. Unfortunately, gets tagged with the name, with the gerrymandering because he's the governor that signs the bill. It's not necessarily believes in it, but uh, you know, it, unfortunately, it, it's associated with his name. But he's the, the man is is really quite extraordinary. He believes in virtue. He believes in country over self. Something um, he believes in an abstract concept called republicanism with a small r, and uh, really uh, takes these concepts and tries to live it to the full. And he's imbuing these concepts of liberty and freedom into the revolutionary movement prior to the revolution in 1775. His mentor is Samuel Adams, and uh, you know there's so much involved, uh, you know, in the, his his beliefs that that like leech into, um, you know, sort of who we are today. And talk about John Glover, who was the leader of the regiment. Uh, John Glover is is really a, a unique individual. He's a self-made man. He starts out as a cobbler and a fisherman, a fisherman and, you know, saves his money, buys a bar. The bar's, you know, incredibly, he's a bartender. He's incredibly successful. And he's buy, he starts to buy fishing boats and trading boats. And he, he creates, a, he has a fleet of um of boats prior to 1774-75 and um Glover is an incredibly instrumental character in the book he's a five foot three kind of stocky uh, handsome very charismatic uh individual that is uh you know a fiery and uh, ardent patriot and um these men are very important to the early revolutionary movement because they take the trading um, lines or, or supply or lines that they have and convert them into supply lines. And in prior to the Revolutionary War and during the Revolutionary War, the critical resource that the colonies did not have was gunpowder. And these men were bringing in gunpowder through their contacts. Uh, in the Dutch East Indies, as well as Spain. And um, it's Elbridge Gary and John Glover and Jeremiah Lee and other members who really, they form, they, 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 they're the first to talk about an alliance or alliances in their trading relationships that span decades become our alliance with Spain uh, through their contacts. And they bring in the gunpowder. And it's really worth noting that General Gage and the British know that the Achilles heel of the colonists is gunpowder. And they are ardently trying to disarm Americans by capturing all of the gunpowder supplies and then also forbidding weapons and gunpowder from entering the colonies. Because they know that if they can disarm Americans like they had done in Scotland and Ireland, there won't be an American revolution. It will be a political revolution that will just fizzle out. 
and they're very actively trying to disarm Americans. And the, the, the Marbleheaders, through their training context, bring in this crucial supply. I'm one of the first scholars to really connect all the dots because all of the operations at the beginning of the war revolve around the, the capture and seizure of, of gunpowder. And it's really quite fascinating. The early revolution is um, the, the revolutionary ideas that men like that uh, Gary are, are fomenting. It, it kind of gets into the zeitgeist, the mood of the country, uh, the press um, kind of pushes the, the concepts of liberty and freedom, even though there is a, a, a loyal or Tory press as well. But it's imbued in, in sort of American society. But what happens is a powder arsenal in Somerville in 1774 in September is raided by Gage's men. And um, they steal the, they take the powder out of there and the colonists are enraged and literally 10, like over nearly 10,000 individuals descend on Boston common. And the, the, the rumor is that Americans were killed and they are, uh, you know, armed and, uh, you know, gauges sees where things are going. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, the Marbleheaders and other revolutionary figures who are uh, main characters in the book, like Joseph Warren, emerge from the shadows and calm the, co- the crowd. So it's a nonviolent protest. Um, but things change from that moment on. They know that if they're disarmed, they will be, um, you know, their freedoms will be destroyed. And it, this is something that occurs uh you know, over a series of time, there's the Boston massacre. There's the um, the Boston Tea Party, which throws the entire town of Boston out of work because the British closed the port. Um, Marblehead is 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 sanctioned too. The um, the Fisheries Act, for instance, closes down the Grand Bank, so all these men are going to be out of work. And um, you know, they realize that their freedoms are at stake because the the, the crown installs their own judges so that the law will be whatever the crown says. Um, and, you know, things are just turning very rapidly in the wrong direction, even though many of these men still believe in the king and want to be, um, you know, under British rule, but they just want to be treated fairly. But it's it's going the wrong way. And Gage is ordered basically to not only disarm the Americans, but also round up all the ringleaders and, and, and squ- squash the rebellion. And more troops are coming, but Gage knows that he has to buy uh, time because he doesn't have enough men because the Americans are very – there's many, many Americans that are um, outnumbering him and his forces. Talk about the way this experience, what you were just describing, really portends to what happens later and really sets the stage, sets the mood for the attitudes after the war is coming to a close. The uh, you know a lot of American values are formed um, in this time period. The um, the fear of disarmament is is a big deal, um, which eventually translates into the Second Amendment, um, and, and the fear of a standing army. There's there's they loathe the the possibility of that. Um, but then there's also an American way of war that's formed. Um, the 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 tactics change based on uh, Americans fight differently. We're not fighting on uh, battlefields in Europe. We're, we're in, you know, many cases we'll, we'll fight behind um, obstructions like stone fences or fences, et cetera. And uh, collapsible defenses form amphibious warfare. The Marblehead Regiment and the Indispensables pioneer much of that. Um, you know, it's really important that the reader know, know that the Marblehead Regiment was in the key inflection points of the war. Um, And what I mean by that is they save Washington's army at the Battle of uh, Battle of Brooklyn, where the army is it's destroyed. Practically, Um, they fall back to their fortifications and Washington has to decide to fight or retreat. He decides to wisely retreat. But these men um, in, in the revolution is literally rests on their brawny shoulders. They have to row the entire army, 10,000 men across the river, which is swirling and everything else. And none of it works initially. And a, a loyalist tries to tip off the British, but that fails. Um, you know, there's a whole chain of events that are just quite miraculous, but they're able with their skill and their teamwork to bring the army across against all odds. 
and a miraculous fog even comes in and screens the movement at exactly the right time in creating the American Dunkirk. It's, an, it's a remarkable, one of the greatest evacuations in world history, uh, which saves the army, and it's all because of these men. And they do it over again, over and over. Um, in, for instance, uh, the Battle of Pelham Bay, where the, the British make a, 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 a landing, um, an amphibious landing. They, they, they repel them initially at a place called Throng's Neck, and then later at Pelham Bay, allow the army to escape. Um, it, but it's at Trenton that the Marbleheaders and the indispensable men of the army come through again. Washington has four movements of his army across the Delaware River to attack Trenton. Washington kind of always has complicated plans, which um, in, in one sense can be beneficial because you have multiple prongs attacking a single objective. But there, uh, the, the icy river of the Delaware was impassable to only – only the skilled mariners of, of Marblehead were able to make the crossing. Everyone else failed that night, and they brought the army across. And, um, you know, I think most people have no clue about this. The, um, the Marbleheaders, um, without orders, they advance to the southern portion of the town, and they capture a crucial bridge across Aspenpea Creek. And then they set up a series of cannon on the high ground. And meanwhile, the rest of Washington's army is encircling Johann Rahl, the Hessian commander, who was a brilliant commander, by the way, and a, quite the hero of the revolution uh, after capturing White Plains and um, Crucial Hill there and also Fort Washington, is surrounded. And there's no escape because they capture Aston Peak Creek Bridge. And that is a massive deal. It's the most important real estate in North America at the time because they cut out R R Johann Rolf's only escape route, and it is a double envelopment, decisive victory. Unlike most of the victories in the, in the American Revolution, the entire garrison is captured, but it's only one battle in 10 crucial days of three battles where the Marbleheaders play an important role. But, Jeff, I think the most important thing that nobody has ever written about is the impact of a virus that, that plagued Marblehead in 1773 and 74. And, you know, it's quite interesting because the town is divided politically between loyalists and patriots. And it's the Marbleheaders that come up with a very novel solution for the time, sort of earth break, groundbreaking um science, they come up with an inoculation hospital that they fund. The loyalists in the town don't like it, and um, the, the hospital starts to inoculate patients, but then there was one group that actually helped, you know, it didn't, it didn't work well, and it helped uh, the virus spread a little bit more, and uh, they burned the hospital to the ground, the, the loyalists, um, and Glover and his men actually contacted the sheriff. They rounded these men up, put them in jail. But a, a mob of about a thousand people, um, you know, I, I, I called these this stuff from the original newspapers and diaries of the time. They attacked the jail with axes and crowbars, broke through it, freed the men. And then the patriots in the town had their homes surrounded by an angry mob and they were you know, terrified of being killed. And this would have a profound impact on their on, on how they would conduct themselves. But the silver lining in all of this was the man that was in charge of that inoculation hospital, Dr. Nathaniel Bond, who's an obscure person that's never been written about. Um, he was a patriot, and he treated British soldiers at Lexington and Concord, and they initially thought that he was a traitor because of that. And they surrounded his house, a mob did. He demanded a court-martial. I have the original letter that has been lost to to in time until now. Uh, from, from Elvidge Gary demanding a court-martial, he is exonerated by the facts. He becomes the fighting surgeon of the regiment. But the reason why this is important and why the virus changes things, Washington calls upon him to inoculate the Continental Army. In 1777, after the Battle of Trenton in Princeton, the army was all pox, the same virus that hit Marblehead. And it's dying, 20%. Uh, are infected by it, and many, many, many are casualties. Dr. Bond inoculates the entire army and saves it 
so that it can fight again against the British. But Dr. Bond dies and perishes as a result, and he is an obscure figure that has never been written about until The Indispensables. Talk a little bit about your sense of bringing this history and bringing these characters alive in a contemporary sense, this this remarkable ability of, of yours in really taking us to these places as they happen. As a writer and a historian, this is something I really relish. I, um, I visit all of the places I write about. I walk the battlefields. I go to their homes. I go to their graves. Um, it gives you a different sense. It's kind of like a detective, you know, it, 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 that investigates a murder scene. Um, you've got to go to the scene of the crime. You can't just write about it. You know, you know, um, I do go to these places. I go to the primary sources. I really glean the, uh, the material and I don't, I don't put my opinion in there. I let the, the story tell itself. And I use a lot of the, um, the uh, the great oral histories of the American Revolution, which are untapped, these are pension files, and um, they uh, they had to swear under oath what they saw and did uh, in a courtroom. So they they have uh, an amazing sense of uh, of voice that I insert into the narrative, and then I um, you know with all of the things that I do. Uh, assemble this mosaic that's been shattered into a thousand, you know, 10,000 pieces and then start to assemble it like an archaeologist and let the narrative tell the story and let the, the characters tell the story. Patrick O'Donnell, his latest work is The Indispensables, the diverse soldier mariners who shaped the country, formed the Navy and rode Washington across the Delaware. Patrick, it is always a pleasure. It is always great to share this history and, and to hear you bring it alive. Thank you, Jeff. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, we've had an amazing um, publication week. The Wall Street Journal gave it a, a, a rave review, and the book is number, is number 10 on, on, in the top 10 on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. And, um, you know, it's just been a really uh, – the, the town of Marblehead is very proud of the book. It's been just a great, great journey so far. Patrick O'Donnell, The Indispensables, I thank you so much. Jeff, thanks a lot. I really appreciate coming on your show.